Welcome to EPG Parshala. The paper that we are looking at is 20th century English literature and the module is on Harold Pinter's play The Birthday Party. We will start with an introduction to Harold Pinter. Pinter was born in 1930 and he received the Nobel Prize in 2005. His major plays include The Room, The Birthday Party, The Dumb Waiter, The Homecoming, Betrayal. His plays are noted for their non-conformist stance and political undertones. His plays defy conventional modes, tropes of literary writing. The, they are marked by an open-ended plot sequence and uh, there is a lot of thematic ambiguity. They are all in that sense very, very open-ended. Now, you will find this happening not just with these plays, even the later plays that Pinter wrote, uh, On the Road, for example, they all have this uh, open-endedness. It's very difficult to pin down a Pinter play and say this is what it is about. Let's have an overview of this play. The birthday party is considered by many as his one of his best plays. What it does is celebrates the inherent ambiguity of human nature. This is an absurd play and it defies at the same time defies categorizations and acquires new levels of meanings or signification. There are many many layers in this play and this is the reason why it's very difficult to get a hold of this play. Consider for example the plot sequences. What kind of sequences are they? The characters, what logic do they have? The characters are illogical. What are the motivations for their actions, for what they say, for their behavior? They are motivated for or by unknown reasons. There are many things that are not said in the play. And when we read the play, we know that it is deliberate. We know that it is for these reasons that may, it is deliberate on the part, let us say, of the of Pinter not to give you reasons about motivation. Because when we give reasons, we would say that there is this cause and effect structure. And this is something that you cannot look for in a Pinter play. The title, Birthday Party itself, is steeped in ambiguity. There are different layers of ambiguity. Is this birthday party fact or is it fancy? Whose birthday party is it? Right? Is it a party at all? The idea of truth that we all look for in something is something is posited and truth is posited as a construct. What the play also does is to explore the shifting sands or realms of reality. There is no one reality. We start suspecting if there is reality at all. When we talk about Pinter, there is a term that is always associated with him. And this term is comedy of menace. It's quite oxymoronic. How can comedy be menacing? But this is the term that is used to describe Pinter's plays. Now, this is a term coined by Irving Wardle. Comedy of menace refers to a kind of drama where the elements of comedy and menace are intertwined. They come together. When menace comes, how can we think about it as comedy? 
That is why I said it's oxymoronic. Now the characters feel threatened by a force which they cannot name, they cannot put their finger at. There is this underlying threat all the time. You never know what's going to come and hit you. There is always the fear of the unexpected because there is nothing that you can expect to happen. So this is the comedy of menace. There is fear that is generated when you know that there is some, you, even when you know that something unexpected, something is going to happen, you start thinking about it and that can generate fear because you don't know what's going to happen. When will it happen? What will happen? You never know. Now, all that can at some time, this fear of something that's about to happen, that could be menacing, that fear can very often contribute to the element of humor. Now, when we talk about humor, it is not belly tickling humor that we are talking about. It's not humor that will uh, enable a grin across your face. This humor is essentially dark. Major dramatists associated with this genre include, of course, Harold Pinter, David Campton, um, N.F. Simpson and Nigel Dennis. Now, let us look at this play as an example of comedy of menace. But then, before we do that, we must keep in mind that Harold Pinter did not believe in a categorization like this. He does not believe like that. However, we will say that the play exhibits certain traits of the comedy of menace. There is menace that permeates the play. It's there throughout this play. All the conversations in which Stanley is engaged in, all these are uh, rife with veiled threats and danger, impending danger. Something is about to happen. This is the feel that we have. There, there is this feel of uncertainty. There is this feel of insecurity. Now, this is something that emerges quite powerfully in this play. Now, when uh, we are suspicious of each other. Look what would happen. If I am not comfortable with you, then think of a situation uh, when, where something like that happens. Think of a situation where you are in a room with a person uh, with whom you are not comfortable. You are suspicious of that person and imagine that the two of you are in that room. Try to think what would happen. Similarly, Characters in this play are suspicious of one another. Meg, look at the relationships in this play between Meg and Stanley or Goldberg and Stanley or McCann and Stanley. There is distrust. There is suspicion. So look what happens. There will not be proper communication. Communication fails. Human relationships collapse there will be fragmentation. And we see all this in the birthday party. So it's not mutual respect that we have, it's mutual suspicion that is predominant. Now that is the dominant tone in this play. The play opens, it goes on, we think it is smooth, it is not smooth, there is suspicion there. There are uncom uncomfortable silences and moments in this play. A lot of things are unsaid and as the audience or as the reader we try to guess things and that accentuates this tone of mutual suspicion. And this is aggravated further with the entry of Goldberg and McCann. With their entry, tension escalates. There are these exchanges that you have, conversations in this play. They are very ordinary kind of exchanges, very mundane exchanges. 
what they do is they seem to uh, highlight again this hidden tension there is this emptiness in the conversation now these exchanges un- are underlined underscored by this hidden tension now i don't want to say that things come to a boil this menace reaches its high point in stanley's helplessness in the last act he is broken at the end of the play and that's when we see menace reaching its high point there is uh, it's very difficult let me say to summarize what happens in this play by the tenor of what i have been saying so far i am sure you would have guessed so there is another aspect that has to be looked at when we uh, read a play like the birthday party and that is the use of silences and pauses pinter uses them very well he is a master of silence and pause and uh critics have identified them as pinterian silences and pauses now the pauses and silences that he uses add a very, add a deeper significance to these texts we all pause we all give different time in our conversation so that others understand what we are trying to say but the pause as the pauses and silences that pinter uses serve a very different purpose we need to listen to the pauses and the silences as much as we listen to the words that are uttered the silences that you have in pinter and hands for example stanley's past is mysterious now stanley doesn't tell us much about his past and whenever you have questions there there are only pauses from stanley's from stanley's side so his mysterious past is hinted at by the pauses that he gives and silences that you have now there is one other thing to be said pauses suggest an inability to communicate it suggests a lot of hesitation where you are not very sure if you can even speak out now we will look at the major themes and motives we will try and identify four or five here there are i'm sure there are more which is there for you the student to find out identity is a major theme here apathy and change confusion and order misogyny and violence blindness these are four or five themes that we have identified now let us take one of them one after the other identity the f- fluidity of identity is a major trope in pinterian oeuvre identities we know are fluid they are flexible they are always changing and and so it's very interesting to see how stanley is maniacally trying to hide his identity what is stanley's identity do we get to know that he is hostile in the presence of others who threaten his privacy now the idea of of a private space is something that you find repeatedly in pinter the idea of privacy is so very interestingly worked out in pinter's play here stanley is hostile to the presence of others who threaten his privacy now is he a very private person we cannot say that what it suggests is a deeper intolerance of the presence of the other of others or even of the other every character in this play has certain ulterior motives there are these two men who walk into the play goldberg and mccann they deliberately mislead meg regarding their identity when we read the play we have this feeling that goldberg's past appears like a carefully 
cultivated story, a cultivated, carefully cultivated fable. Goldberg has more than one name. He has adopted various names that could possibly indicate a very shady past. Can one trust Goldberg? Can one trust a person who has adopted various names at various times? We cannot. So there is this question of uh, suspecting the intent, the intention of Goldberg or even the identity of Goldberg. Look at the other theme, apathy and change. Consider Meg. Meg does not like change. She likes to be cocooned in a comforting web not just a comforting web, a comforting web of deceit. She likes everything to be fixed, stable. She becomes, in a way, a symbol of fixity. The house, Meg's house, is an extension of Meg's self. It is indicative of an unwillingness to change. Meg's relationship, for example, with her husband, P.T., also remains stagnant throughout. We will see that in, in the play, uh, in the interaction that the husband has with the wife. P.T. tries to preserve Meg's illusions. Their life is monotonous. It's made up of an endless cycle of repetitive patterns. They seem to be very content with their monotonous life. When things change, when change happens, it disrupts the normalcy of their life. Now, that normalcy is quite ironic here. This is quite evident uh, going by what we have seen so far of the life that Meg and P.T. lead. Confusion and order. The characters in this play seem to advocate absolute chaos by their inconsistent words and their deeds, their actions. Meg lives in a world of delusion. There are stories, for example, that Stanley and Goldberg tell. These stories lack coherence. Confusion is created in this play. Confusion is created desperately. Why? Confusion is created to mask truth, if at all it's possible to arrive at some truth. So, there is nothing that one can grasp to understand what's happening. McCann perhaps is one character who is bent on preserving order. But then, he is dangerous. His methodical stripping of papers becomes a symbolic act. This is towards the end of the play, where you have him tearing strips paper into strips with precision, very meticulously. And there is an underlying menace or even violence in that act. See, you don't have to hit a person. Imagine Stanley is sitting there and McCann is sitting opposite him and tearing this paper to shreds. That tells you what they are capable of doing. Stanley plays a drum and he plays a drum. That playing of the drum is a symbol of chaos. At one point in the play, Stanley beats the drum violently. This violent and savage beating of the drum suggests the barbarity that will follow. Yet another theme that we have is misogyny and violence. It's a heavy theme to take up. Violence is closely tied to the misogynistic attitude in the play. There's so much of violence here. It's understated. Much of it is understated, but then you feel it very strongly. The play hints that Stanley is being hunted for a crime that is related to women. We don't know. 
But one thing is certain when we watch the play, he is rude and dismissive towards Meg. Goldberg, for example, deliberately insults Lulu, the young girl, is an object of for sexual gratification. At one point, Stanley even tries to rape her. Goldberg takes advantage of her. In other words, there are two women in this play and they are marginalized. They are almost stereotyped. Meg is demonized. Lulu emerges as a brainless sex doll. In other words, the female characters do not contribute much to the action of the play. Meg is denigrated by the men in her life. Lulu is sexually exploited. The women are not portrayed in a positive light. They are somewhere in the background. It's a very difficult world in which to survive. Now, Pinter's problematic stance on women characters raises a barrage of um, interpretations and questions. Now, uh, these are things that critics have tried to, to deliberate, try to discuss. You also have certain plays where there are no women. Now, can one uh, take Pinter to task for the way in which he presents female characters here? This is a question that you have to think about. There is the last of the themes that we would discuss here, blindness. The male characters remain blind to a sad predicament of Meg and Lulu. The women are duped and they are symbolically blinded. Towards the end of the play, Stanley's glasses are taken away, they are broken. It's a ritual enactment of the loss of vision and knowledge. Meg somehow is blind to the incidents, to the things that happen in her life. She is, not, she is somehow blind to it. So you have Meg who can see but then who is blind. Let's try to sum up this play. We have not touched upon every aspect of this play because many of these absurd plays are like that. It's very difficult to arrive at a very neat conclusion and say this is what it is finish. So let us have a tentative conclusion. The play ends on an ambivalent note. The play is open-ended. There's a lot of fluidity in narration and in action. Now what this fluidity indicates is that possibility of identification that we can have in the contemporary world as well. Finally, this is a play that's a true literary work or masterpiece. Now I would like to uh, say here that the, before when we read a play like Birthday Party, it will be useful if you look at some of Pinter's early plays and then read the birthday party because that will help you to see the kind of things that Pinter does as a playwright in his plays. So I hope that you will enjoy reading Pinter's plays. Thank you.